class I did the same thing. Great, welcome. So this is the, actually the, the last class of the day. We're going to talk about a little bit about overcoming challenges of building IoT applications. Um, so I'm Joseph Zolliker. I am the Director of Technical Marketing. Uh, my background um, is I'm actually running, currently right now, Arrows Intelligence Systems within our organization. Uh, intelligence Systems, the way we describe it at Arrow, is everything related to the Internet of Things, um, industrial internet, M2M, et cetera, et cetera. As we start to see new, new acronyms kind of come on, Arrow, cho ch Arrow chose the term intelligence systems to describe um, the, these type of um, systems. I've been a director of sales for a design services company where I helped kind of bring and vet uh, a number of products to the marketplace. So again, very, very strong background in terms of helping customers overcome the challenges required to actually build a connected product that actually connects somewhere an application around with it. It brings with it a unique set of challenges above and beyond just traditional hardware design. So we'll talk about that. Um, and again, I spent a lot of time, I, I um, lectured the class earlier here on the monetization on M2M, talking about business models and really how to apply business techniques to formulating strategies with respect to IoT. And I'm also editor of a number of uh, industry publications as well. So a lot of years in the space. Um, and again, um, ask you guys to be very open and uh, candid in your questions. So a little bit, you know, we saw yesterday Ali did a very, very nice presentation in terms of where Renaissance is going. If, if there was a couple things that you guys certainly should have taken away is the fact that even companies like Renaissance, Arrow and others, we all have to transform and be different to kind of meet the needs kind of moving forward here in the space. Renaissance is definitely moving away from a hardware center company to actually looking at the entire ecosystem and providing a platform to really simplify the way developers design, deploy, and manage Internet of Things applications. I mean, that's a very, very compelling story for somebody who's the number one microcontroller in the world to actually shift the focus on how they're going to market much differently. And again, we're very, very uh, proud to be part of supporting their ecosystem in a lot of different ways. So what I'll cover, a little bit about intelligent systems, kind of give you kind of a framework when I'm talking about this. What does it mean? What does it look like? I'll share with you some a very, very secret uh, industry trade secrets that because you came into the room, you'll walk away with today. Extra special, no, no charge. We'll talk about design challenges of, of current, things that you face today, as well as new design challenges. Talk about mistakes to avoid and questions and answers. Just a little bit about Aero Electronics. We are a $22 billion company, founded in 1935, 17,000 employees worldwide. We have a Fortune 138 company, 56 countries around the globe, and we have over 100,000 original equipment manufacturers we work with on a day-to-day -day basis. Why is this important? Working with this size and scope of customers on a global perspective exposes us to a lot of different designs, industries, segments, problems, all sorts of things that customers have. It really allows us to create a vast amount of domain knowledge on things to do proper, things to avoid kind of moving forward. So again, it, it's very, very, you know, very, very unique that we get to see the vast range of uh, applications and solutions that are in the marketplace. Things that, you know, again, we can talk about, we can kind of leverage best practices, et cetera, et cetera. So when we talk about this too, our customers' expectations in terms of what they really are expecting from us is really kind of changed as we move forward here, right? They do have new expectations. Everything that we're seeing in this space revolves around services you know, versus just products themselves. If you think and just sit for a moment and kind of pause and think how many different products you have, but then how many of those actually have services associated with those, it is very much moving into a subscription economy. And you need to really start taking a look at well beyond just the hardware, but more in terms of the data that's being created, the information that gets built from that and how that information is used as services to others. A couple of examples I can give you. We all have garage door openers on our, on our home. Back in the day, we all had Craftsman or whatever it was. We just drove up, we pushed the button, and the garage door opened. Currently today, the service, service model is you can go buy something from, like LiftMaster, they'll sell you a gateway, and they have a My, My IQ service, which allows you to use your phone and interact in different ways. Okay, we look at uh, GE with their Brilliant series. I mean, again, gateway technology to control the lights in your house. A lot of these things will be for free but a lot of them will also have with them subscription along with it. And point being is that to differentiate yourself, you do have to provide services. And a lot of stuff that I'm gonna talk about today will go beyond just talking about hardware, processors, 
memory architectures, et cetera, more into other things you may need to consider as you're deploying these systems and applications uh, in, the, in, in the field. So you, know, you kind of talk about this, and I kind of brought this up earlier, right? It's really not about the internet. It's really not about things. It's the, it's the value you can create with the data that you harvest. And I can't stress enough what that means. And we talked earlier in the monetization class, just because you build it doesn't mean they will come. You have to provide value. They have to perceive value in what it is that you create. And we'll talk about that in terms of how to extract, how to mine the information, and different ways to kind of bring it up through the system. So let's talk a little bit about um, you know, what, what I want to talk about in intelligent systems architecture. What do I mean? And this is actually one of the slides that it's, a, it's, it's kind of this um, secret that I kind of always use with this. And, and I, I always kind of tell people, and this was actually one of the first slides I actually created when I rejoined Arrow in this role. Every single Internet of Things application consists of the same five elements. And they're kind of shown up here kind of on the screen. So we have sensors. We have some form of embedded processing. We've got secure communications, both wired and wireless. There's middleware and stacks to kind of run the, the comms, and there's an app for that. And we can test this very, very easily. So for those of you who have a Fitbit on your wrist, my guess is that it has some form of sensors in there. There's an embedded processor, has a Bluetooth radio, there's a stack in there that's running, and there's an app on the phone to allow you to interface with it. And we could go on and on whether we're talking about drug infusion pumps, wind turbine generators, you name it. Every single Internet of Things or every connected Internet of Things or intelligence system is made up of these elements. What's good about this is the fact that it's very, very repeatable in that you don't have to rethink about it every single time. Now, for a lot of us, you know, we are actually very, very um, comfortable with the left side over here to the communications. We may not be as savvy on the other side of this, and we'll talk and kind of walk through it. Security and analytics and a lot of different things are going to span across the board. I'm not going to spend an enormous amount of time about security. Um, for those of you who are here on the panel, you heard the big ugh, the sigh in the room when somebody brought up the whole notion around security, the Internet of Things. Yes, it's vitally important. It has to happen. We need to make sure everything's secure from the edge device, the data in transit, all the way into the data center, to the mobile application. I'm not going to spend an enormous amount of time on that. Um, I think there's plenty of conversation on that. But at the end of the day, right, we're putting all this stuff together, and what we're trying to do is solve business problems, real business problems. You can take a look. This is what a traditional architecture would look like. We have a lot of different things. We can have them talking to mobile devices acting as gateway technology. We can actually have them going into physical gateway technology itself up into the network to the cloud and we can see what we have is this architecture of different now pieces now that you have to think about as you're starting to craft your solution. We're well beyond talking about the little things on the edge that have just the embedded processor in them and some of the comms. Now we have to start to consider how are we going to connect it. Are we going to use a mobile phone as an application or as a gateway? Are we actually going to go ahead and put a physical gateway? What information is filtered? What do we pass through, et cetera, et cetera. So this is actually, um, I don't know, for, for those of you who saw in Harvard Business Review, if you, haven't, if you haven't gotten the article or if you haven't read this particular version, I'd strongly urge you, if you're actually in this space, to get this edition. It's, a very, it's 15, 18 pages. Very, very specific in how smart connector products are transforming from a competitive side. And as we kind of take a look at this, these are, you know, as I, I showed you the first picture before in terms of intelligence systems in a very simplified manner. Now, this is taking that stack and kind of blowing this out even further. These are all the things that you have to now start to consider and take into account as you're designing and developing your Internet of Things applications. You're going to have to come to a realization that you're really, really good at some things and other things you're probably not. And you're going to have to decide, am I going to make it? Am I going to go buy it? Am I going to have something that kind of help me do some of the sorts of things? You know, we talk about this whole notion of identity and security, authentication to the system, you know, all the admin rights, et cetera, et cetera, along with it. We look at the very bottom. Most of us here in the room, I would say, are very, very comfortable in terms of you know, the hardware, the processors, all the comms, all the stuff that kind of goes along with it, operating systems in terms of how they fit, board support packages kind of building up as we move up. Connectivity. You know, we may have used RS-485, 232 in the past. A lot of us have done Ethernet, Wi-Fi. But once we start to move into like, the cellular domain and some of the newer standards that are emerging, we have a whole new set of issues and design risks, right? Do I look at a 
cellular modem and do I consider that I want to actually do a PTCRB certified uh, modem solution versus maybe putting an embedded one down on my board. And again, there's business drivers that kind of will point you in one direction versus the other. Things you have to consider along with that, the additional certification costs that go with it. Once you drop that cellular modem down on your board, and it's not a PTCRB certified device, that edge device now has to go through a certain set of certifications. And if you're not familiar with those, you definitely need to or go find somebody to help you through that. And again, as Aero Electronics, again, we're helping all of our customers walk all the way through the stack and we can be a, uh, a guiding light, if you will, to kind of help you with those decisions. Um, as we move up into the stack, we now talk about this whole notion of the cloud. And again, this, these are just servers that are virtualized in random locations is really all they are. But you know, the, the pervasiveness of the cloud and what's kind of out there we now start to take a look at it and say, you know, what is the, you know, do I do my own application myself? Or do I actually, you know, want to go through and do a load balancer, my data broker, write the service application, or do I look at a platform as a service provider to help me? Or maybe I go to the likes of a, uh, maybe an IBM and, and Amazon or Microsoft Azure, and we do data hosting and storage, but I'm gonna do my application myself. So there's a lot of different trade-offs. There isn't any one right solution. Rules and analytics. I've got all this information. We've all heard the notion of uh, big data. You know, and I think big data has been around forever. The example I always use when I talk about big data is weather. At the most, uh, at the most, macro, uh, my, at the most micro level, we have a bunch of anemometers, temperature, pressure sensors that are measuring and collecting information on all parts of the globe. That information gets aggregated together, is brought to a big system, and then we have supercomputers that crunch the numbers and do all that. That's a, that's a big data problem. They take all that information, all that data, and they create new information, which obviously comes out in the form of forecasts and weather for all of us. In your application, it could vary in terms of what that is. You may be taking information from your system. You may also be using proxy data from other third-party applications. You're gonna to merge together to create new information sets. And then ultimately, your application. On the far left over there, again, you may take this and you say, I'm tracking my fleets, I'm tracking my trucks, or I'm doing service applications, I want to tie it into a CRM system such that I can dispatch jobs, I can bill for them, I can close, et cetera, et cetera. As hardware developers, this is way beyond where we've ever been before. These are decisions that kind of have to be made when you start to deploy these applications. So this kind of really kind of lays down you know, all the big salient pieces that are out there. So I'm just going to stop there and just see if there's any questions, comments. Quiet day. Everybody's been in class all day. Peter, anything? Uh, not yet. Okay. You're almost there. Okay. You're working up to it. I had a candy bar for you if you wanted one, by the way. So this is intentional. I'm not expecting you to read it. But if you really start to kind of put it together and start to see all the work and all the effort that really has to happen to build this sort of stuff up, it becomes a very, very big maze of things that you have to kind of deal with. So how do we kind of you know, get our handle on it? And you can take a look at you know, all the different things that possible. And again, this is just a snapshot, snapshot and a snippet. So where does complexity lie? It can lie from the, from basically from edge connectivity. Let's just say currently today, you know, if you were to come to me and say, hey, we have a bunch of systems that are currently in deployed. We're taking information from multiple manufacturers all over the globe, deployed in all different geographies. Can you help me? connect those systems together and maybe allow me to create an application through a single pane of glass that we can actually manage and create a service that we can sell to our customers. How do we deal with the edge connectivity? The system could have been deployed 20 years ago. It may not even be an IP-based connection. You know, so how do we work with the data, with the data ingestion piece of it, the data, normal, data normal, normalization you know, around that? let alone all the standards, older ones, newer ones. I mean, er earlier here in this room here, the guys were talking about uh, LoRa. We see LoRa, we see Sigfox, you see Thread. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on and on, not to mention all the alliances. Talked about data ingestion normalization. How do we deal with firmware updates and management? And not so much in terms of just sending the information down to the device and just reprogramming it, but how do you know that the edge device that's actually requesting the information is actually a valid device and should be getting information. Or if you flip it around the other way, that the, the firmware download that actually got downloaded is, is actually a certified version of code that's actually supposed to be loaded on a device and not something that has a Trojan or other things on it. We talk about analytics. If you ask the big, you ask the big guys like Microsoft and Amazon and IBM, 
They're going to tell you, send it all to the cloud. We'll take care of it. Really, at the end of the day, though, do you want to have more of a distributed architecture system where I want to have intelligence all the way along the path? Is there anybody in here like from Verizon or AT&T? Okay, so I can pick on those guys too. Perfect. Um, you know, the carriers will do the same thing. Hey, you got that LTE pipe? Yeah, yeah shoot her all up there. Just put her in a Terramark server. We'll take care of it for you. We'll store it to you when you need it. We'll come, we'll come back and get you. You may not, because of the business model you have, want to send every piece of information. Let's just say hypothetically, I'll just give you kind of a crude example. If we're measuring temperature and it's 78 degrees and I mean 10,000 readings throughout the day and the temperature never changes, there's no sense in me sending 78 degrees 10,000 times over the network. I may want to do some filtering local and only send exception data. That when we're, five, um, when we're five deviations out, send this out, go do this, whatever else. And this is where you really kind of need to understand where do you want that intelligence in the stack? Do you want it actually on the physical edge devices itself? Would you want it on the gateway? Would you want it in the cloud? Or would you want all of them? And you have to make some of these decisions. Configuring and management of all these systems, right? Now I've got a bunch of gateways deployed. I want to remotely take a look and say, okay, on any given morning, what's going on in my gateways? Where are they at? Who has errors pending? You know, I want to send updates. I want to do different configurability, all that sort of stuff. I touched on security, and that's all I'm going to say about it. Um, integration of disparate systems. Again, this is kind of where we're talking to systems like, let's just say we're doing uh, PLC controllers from Allen Bradley, Siemens, and other. The interfaces, the way we talk to them, the way we speak to them are different. What you don't want to have is multiple panes of glass that who's ever managing those devices has to have the swivel chair and has to understand the different commands to talk to the different systems. And then service enablement and deployment is, you know, how do we go ahead and get these services out deployed so people can actually use them? And this is just a subset of things that you really have to consider. Any questions, comments? Is it that late in the day? I got free beer, just kidding. So here's kind of a view in terms of some of the typical stuff. And again, if we would roll the clock back a little while, we as designers and developers, we, we focused on our hardware, right? We, we, we looked at it, we said, you know, what is the processing technology I need? What is the peripheral mix I need? Here's a mix of sensors and those type of things. And again, you can kind of see you know, all the different things that can kind of go in here, the communications, all the protocols, you know, how I want to maybe visualize and control a lot of this sort of stuff. And this is the, this is, these are the sorts of things that we're very, very well versed. And we're very, very well, I mean, very comfortable in terms of working with and dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. But if you talk about new challenges, right, in terms of what, what's out there, and I'm going to walk through each one of these a little bit, talking about gateway technology, cloud, security, data, and even at the platform. I'm also going to have um, a tool who's up here with uh, TimeSys. I didn't include in here, and it was, as I saw him out the third day, I thought, you know, I, how, how all this is changing the requirements from operating systems. So I'm also going to have him give a little bit of time in terms of talking about that. You want to actually start with the operating system first? And then maybe just how, back from the day, we talked about in more dealing with embedded devices. Now we have all these comms and all this other stuff and things maybe to consider. I mean, a couple minutes or? Sure. Oh, here, I actually have a microphone for you. Let's see how I got him to do that. That's, that's selling right there. Hi, my name is Atul Bansal. I'm from TimeSys. We are an embedded Linux company uh, and working very closely with Arrow on their intelligent services program, uh, working with a lot of APIs. Now, when people talk about IoT, it's not the new thing which people talk about. Um, we have been doing IoT for a long time. It was not called IoT. Uh, people used to call it M2M. If you look at the old, one of the oldest applications is the OnStar. That's what the IoT application. They were doing all vertical stacks. Now, if you look at the, from the operating system point of view, what we are trying to do here is we're trying to use shared resources whether it's the cloud, it's AT&T network or Verizon network, it's getting into the um, um, Microsoft, Azure, or AWS, all these are shared resources and how we're trying to build it. But from operating system point of view, you are looking at sensors and gateways and how does operating system interact with that? And what you want is you have basically 
At one time, our system did not have TCP IP stack, nothing. Now, all these things come with connectivity. And what you're trying to do is, instead of trying to um, <coughs> make everything from scratch, you want to assemble pieces. It's like Lego. You want to pick up things and make sure you can put them together very simply, very quickly, and just start writing your application. Uh, that's where things, so we are from Linux. We are now, all the microcontrollers, they're all trying to get to that point, and we want to prepackage things that you need. So think of a system that you say, oh, I need a gateway, and the gateway should be able to talk to these 15 protocols, but I'm connecting to AT&T gateway, or I'm connecting to my um, Amazon. I should be able to say, click Amazon AWS. It should pick those clients Put it in the, your software packages. Put the, I want this um, six low pan or whatever the communication protocol you want to choose. You should be able to select those things. And the system should be smart enough. This is I'm talking about the software that is running on your device. System should be smart enough to pull all these pieces together, build a runtime BSP and SDK and give it to you. And that's the nirvana. And then you can just write your secret sauce on top of that. And that process should become simpler and easier. So this is the job of operating system guys, stack guys. As the technology becomes complex, we want to simplify its usability. And that's the challenge. I mean, we want to make things, we want to improve things and make things simple at the same time. Perfect. Thank you, Joe. So I'll talk a little bit in terms of um, you know, you know moving through kind of kind of the stack here and then um, let's see does it oh yeah it does do that okay so from a gateway perspective so so actually the the function of a gateway is 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 multifaceted one it it acts as a bridge to kind of take a, a one form of protocol and move it to another so we may have non IP based sensors non IP devices that. We know we can't connect to the internet, but in order to be able to access those devices and get the information and do useful things with it, we need the gateway to translate to actually move this stuff to the wide area network. That might be Ethernet, that might be Wi-Fi, that might be cellular. That's a very, very basic function in terms of what it does. In the early days of M2M IoT, people put the gateways in there primarily for that function, and it was more or less a bridge, send the information, let's send it to the cloud guys, and they acted and operated on it, and life was, was really, really good. But as again, as we started to think a little bit more about where we want the intelligence, we found out that within systems that relying on that, that turnaround time and waiting for the cloud to make a decision to send some stuff back, in real time applications may not be fast enough. We needed to move in, um, data analytics closer to the edge. So now we start to see in terms of um, intelligent gateways, we have the ability to actually you know, um, work with the data ingestion normalizing of that information. We can do data filtering on the gateway. We can do alerts, we can do all sorts of management. Other applications too is, not everybody wants to move everything to the cloud. We have a lot of our customers that come to us and say, Joseph, here's what we want to do. We want to actually run the premise and run your services on the gateway and we don't ever want to connect to the internet. We have the ability and the capabilities, and what we're doing now and bringing to the marketplace to allow our customers to run either you know, all our services in the cloud through Aero Intelligence Services, or you can actually run them on premise on the gateway itself. And it changes the model where, again, customers don't have to connect. They want to maybe keep their stuff very, very private. We also have the ability to, in those applications, customer says, you know, some stuff I want to keep local, but other stuff I want to push out. We can also do that model as well. So again, it's kind of fundamentally changing, you know, kind of um, what it is and the role of the gateway. And the other thing too along with this is that should the communication link break between the edge device and the cloud, maybe just say north of the gateway, you know, how does, what happens with your system then? If I don't have that link established, I lose my connection. And you guys all have cell phones, driving down the road, power's right in front of you, phone hangs up, what's up? You know, and again, depending upon your system, your application, that may or may not be acceptable. Again, if you have more of that information down below, I can get certain information, I can make certain decisions closer to the edge, quicker, et cetera, et cetera. 
So if we talk about next one about you know the cloud, and again, if we talked about this, we're talking about more like virtualized servers where information is being hosted, stored, et cetera, et cetera. You know, do I want to take a look at this? Do I actually want to do a public instance? Do I want to do a private instance? Maybe, maybe there's a hybrid. You start to talk about the differences, and some people may say, well, what's the cost associated with either one? And at the end of the day, when we talk about from a cost perspective and even from a security perspective, public may not be any less secure than private, depending upon how that's structured at the data center. Who's actually you know, in the rack with you, how they kind of set it up, et cetera, et cetera. We talk about embedded, I talked about the gateway, using a gateway physically now as that cloud device itself, local storage you know, on this side of the firewall. Again, these are the things that you're gonna have to think about when you kind of craft your application. Where do I want this stuff to live? Where do I want it to go? Where do I want this to operate? We talk about security here, right? Security in itself, what you, what you do need to consider is what is gonna be your strategy. And it's interesting, when I, when I do talk to customers, I'll ask him, is security, I could ask this room here, right? Is security important to you guys? And everybody's gonna raise their hand, they're gonna say yes. And then I'm gonna say, okay, so give me some ideas of what some of you guys do for security. Well, we have AES 128, 256 encryption, we use username and password and everything else. Like, okay, great, fine, okay, you do what everybody else does. Long term though, what's your strategy? And again, just because you develop your device and you do something specific that you think is unique on your device, but you don't actually work on the data in transit, data at rest, data on your mobile application, you leave yourself kind of exposed. So again, you're gonna really have to kind of think about your investment in security, and I can pretty much say, selling this stuff for a long time, nobody ever wants to pay for security. They like the blanket you know, that it provides in terms of the comfortness, but nobody wants to pay for it. And again, end of the day, right, it's all about, ah, you know, I don't think I can afford that and bill materials cost to go ahead and put this in my product. Now the next day, and again, the example I would give out of Minneapolis is, is, is Target, you know, kind of what happened with these guys. And here it is over the Christmas holidays and they get, they get, a, they get a security breach. I can pretty much guarantee, guarantee you they probably spent 10 times or 100 times the amount of money they, afterwards than what they would have did before. It's like any of you here and your house. You don't have a security, you lock the doors, you close the windows, you have a break in, I can guarantee you your wife is telling you you're gonna get a security system tomorrow, I don't care what it costs and you're gonna put it in. And that's the way that works. And with security, it's kind of always after the fact. But you know, as you move forward, you gotta really understand is what is the brand corrosion that will actually take place if something happens? And you need to have a strategy. You know, things that we, we strongly urge, doing vulnerability testing. Hire an independent consultant who's skilled in the space to take a look at where your vulnerabilities lie. They're gonna give you a list of things. You may not be able to do everything. No different than the guy comes out to your house and you tell them what you want, you're gonna pick and choose different things. Not everybody can, pull, you know, can afford iron doors, bulletproof, bulletproof glass on their house, right? But I can have some really nice locks and some deadbolts and it's gonna you know, deter the majority of the people and the individuals. Oops. That's weird. Let's see what that happens. What is this? We have some, some security things. Um, let's talk about that a little bit. So different thing, I, I hadn't seen the, uh, the deck since I created it and submitted it. I was going like, where, where did this slide come from? Some so top 10 things you can do to mitigate software uh, in your devices. So obviously establishing and maintaining control you know, over your inputs and your outputs, you know, lock down the environment. I mean, these are just good traditional design technique types of things. Um, you know, assume that basically you can be subverted, your code can be read for anybody. Um, use industry accepted uh, security features instead of inventing your own. I mean, there's a lot of people that actually are experts in security. Um, you don't need to always invite it by yourself. Use libraries and, uh, and other frameworks that make it easier to avoid introducing weakness. You know, again, introduce security into the whole software development life cycle. In, in short, have a strategy. It's security by the seat of your pants is not a strategy. Use a broad mix of methods um, to prevent weakness. Um, lock down clients to interact with your software. These are some of the more common things that, you know, again, from a developer perspective, you can kind of take a look at. Let's talk a little bit about data. So we, we all hear this notion about big data, the gazillion devices are publishing all this information. End of the day, 
what information is really valid? What do you actually really need? How do you, how do you ascertain that? You may, you may think about it today and say, eh, I don't need that information. I'm not going to do anything with it. And five years from now, somebody says, you know, had we collected that one piece of information over five years, we could have did these algorithms and we could have made this super intelligent decision about what we're doing. You really got to start to take a look at what is it, you know, what, what information is, is truly valuable in your system and where it's going to store and where it's going to reside. Um, not everything has to be stored. Not everything has to be stored in a real-time environment. Um, example being, if there's certain things you need to act on and you need answers very, very quickly, you want that stuff more in a real-time environment. If it's historical data, like my wind turbine generator, what it's been doing for the past five years, do I actually need real-time access to that data? I probably don't. If I waited 20 minutes to plot out my graph to show me what I've saved over five years, I'm probably okay. It's going to save you money, time, and effort, et cetera, et cetera. We talked about data filtering. Do I want to do data filtering? What do I want to throw out? What do I want to keep? Where do I want to do the filtering? So the most overused, well, one of the most used words in the marketplace is, is the term platform. And, and what does that really mean? Now, again, we, we, um, yesterday when Ollie um, was doing his presentation, he talked about the Synergy platform. And again, from the Renaissance perspective, what they're looking to do Creating a platform to simplify the design, development, employment of Internet Things application makes, makes total sense. For you guys as developers or as um, enterprises and OEMs, you need to make a decision. Are you going to create a platform that you're going to bring to the marketplace? Why would you do this? So I'm going to use the example of uh, Nest. And again, this is more or less just talking opinion, more so than actual practical knowledge. But like all things, when that idea was, was, was conceived, somebody laid out a circuit board with features and functions on it. It, doesn't, it didn't look like the nest that we all know. But at some point, somebody was going to take the hardware, they checked it all out, they checked all the chip selects, all the address lines, read, write, and everything was working, everything is fine. Now somebody needs to create an application. Somebody needs to create the application on top of it. Typically what happens is that hardware gets handed over to a software guy, and he starts coding from line one, all the stuff he needs to do to make this work. Now, the developer may not actually be part of Nest. He could be a third party developer in another part of the world. What we typically do in traditional design is we force application developers to act like embedded programmers. And by that, what I mean is we, we force them to understand the hardware. I'll, I'll just deviate a little bit here. Let's just say our our Nest thermostat that we're building had a GPS module and a couple other comms modules on it. So for the developer to write the application, what he's going to have to do is he's going to have to get the, the manual from the uh, GPS manufacturer. He's going to have to look at all the registers, the bits, and he's going to have to write his application and kind of configure it around it. He's not a hardware guy. He's a web developer. Okay? In the world of programmers, there's 500,000 C++, embedded guys that really understand hardware well, and there's an infinite number of third and fourth graders that can write mobile applications on APIs up here. And what we're trying to do is get all those third and fourth graders to actually write applications. But what we have to do is we have to abstract the complexity, like a tool set, of all this stuff underneath. So we have two choices in how we can do this. We can continue to provide a software development kit that forces a web developer to learn hardware, which is just fraught with peril. It costs us all time, money, and effort, et cetera, et cetera. Or what we can do is we can do create a platform around it and actually transform that experience such that rather than having the uh, application programmer learn all the hardware, we abstract that from him, and we present all that information as a set of APIs and allows him to interact with the system through APIs. So now imagine, instead of me having to read a 300-page manual from, let's just pick U-Blocks, and try to understand their GPS module, well, maybe what I just do is I do an API call, say, configure GPS. Oop, module's up and running. It comes up in a very, very standard way. Oh, same with Bluetooth. Let's just say, hypothetically, we had two Bluetooth modules on a thing. Don't ask me why we'd have two Bluetooth modules. One's from one vendor, one's from the other, but the way they talk are different. Do I want to force my application programmer to learn two different Bluetooth protocols? No. 
I want to go ahead and normalize that information and the way he interacts with it through an API set. Another example I would give you would be, let's say we wanted to add cellular connectivity. Boss comes over to you and says, hey, great news. AT&T loves us. We're going to put a GSM modem on our device. You need to interface with Jasper Control Center. And oh, by the way, here's the book for all their commands. Learn it because you need to talk to Jasper. Program is all happy, codes it all up, gets it all done, working. Boss comes back the next day and says, hey, great news. Verizon loves what we're doing. By the way, you're talking to Enphase now. He gets a new man. So what does he got to do? He's got to learn Enphase. Codes it all up. Boss comes in the third day. Great news, we're going global. Vodafone wants to go do business with us. And on and on and on and on it goes. And if, if we continue to go in that regard, what ends up happening is, is that the application is so complicated that any changes on any side cause us to break down. And where we're going with this is, this is where we're having a state-of-the-art platform that allows software developers to actually create applications through APIs as the direction that we really need to be going here. So as you're looking at this, there's different types of platforms out there. You guys will see a lot of different trade publications and it will say, um, let's pick on ThingWorks. Is anybody from ThingWorks here before I say anything? I should have said that beforehand. But, um, so you might read that and actually ThingWorks gets a lot of great press. A lot of great press. Just like uh, Jasper. Jasper's eva eva evaluation is $3.4 billion. If I knew nothing about the space, I said, boy, I better go do business with these two guys. I'd go to my boss and I'd say, hey, we gotta do business with Jasper. Look at this, this evaluation. These guys are like, we're cool. Problem is, as long as I'm doing cellular communication, GSM, AT&T, and 23 other carriers, I'm golden. But as soon as I wanna do CDMA, guess what? Hmm, I need to do another platform. And same thing with the other one. So when we're looking at this, I mean, there's a lot of different choices out there, and there really isn't a one-size kind of fits all in what's going on now. You saw what Ollie was talking about with Renaissance, what they were doing, building a more encompassing platform. That's kind of the future kind of moving forward. Peter, do you want to talk a little bit? I mean, obviously your company, you guys have developed, I hate to use the term platform because I think it, it minimizes some of the stuff that you guys have done, but talk about some of the challenges in terms of this space. Yes. No. Are you going to share your stage? Absolutely. I'll share my stage with you. How about that? All right. Well, thank you. Um, I won't take much time. I think, I think you've done a good job of scaring the crap out of everybody. No, I didn't. <laughs> you know, one of, so my company is a company called Bug Labs, and uh, we've been around for a while. I founded the company back in 2006, so we've, we've been through uh, plenty of these challenges. But one of the things that I would encourage everybody to understand is that, you know, you can start by saying, we want the grand plan, and we're going to go architect it and then go do it. And I would argue that's probably the wrong approach, because what ends up happening is you have sort of analysis paralysis. You look at this and you say, oh my god, I don't have answers for most of this stuff, so I'm going to wait until I do, in which case you never really start, right? And so one of the things that we've noticed is that, you know, how many people here have heard of Arduino, Raspberry Pi, Beagle Board, you know, all these things. Raspberry Pi, I think, sold something like 3 million boards over the past couple of years. And that's a big number. And the reason why they're so popular is because they allow you to fail without getting fired. Like, you could spend 50 bucks on a, on, a, on a Linux computer. You can do some stuff. You can show your boss. You can show your investors. And if they say it was the stupidest thing I've ever seen, you're like, okay, well, whatever. Next, right? And there, there hasn't been a huge investment. And I think what's starting to happen with web APIs, low-cost computing, and so on, is that you can, start, you can start doing things. You can start iterating. You can start talking to customers. You're either internal or external customers. You can talk to uh, partners, and you can try things. And you can sort of figure these things out, not necessarily in a theoretical fashion, but by literally doing it, OK? So do you want Wi-Fi or cell? I don't know. Let's find out. And you can actually do these things without breaking the bank. So my whole thing that I would I would I'd put up here is that, yes, there are lots and lots of challenges, and you can really scare yourself to death trying to figure them all out right now. But I would argue that you're going to surprise yourself as you go, because I think it was some German general who said that no plan survives contact with the enemy. Because that's just the fact of the matter, is that your plans are worth what, you know, the paper they're written on until you actually start doing them. So I would say all this stuff is great. It's all uh, information that has come from people who have done it, so you have to read it and you got to know about it, but I wouldn't let it stop you from literally jumping in. And I think with Renaissance, 
Um, they have a board called the RL78, which is a dev kit, $99 has a lot of great sensors on it, a lot of great things you can use it for like right away. You can just plug it in and go. I think the uh, Synergy boards are gonna have the same thing. I mentioned Arduino and Raspberry Pi and so on. So um, we have a saying in our company that we, we sort of have a tongue in cheek, we talk to our customers, we say doing is better than thinking. And it's tongue in cheek because obviously that's not always the case, but we do find that doing, actually getting it done and showing yourself, does this work, does it not work, is far better than just speculating. So. Fantastic. Thank you, Peter. So again, you know, again, as, as we <laughs> as we kind of take a look at this, I mean, these are some of the challenges you're going to have to consider. So it depends upon, you know, again, where are you at in your maturity model? Are you just starting out? Are you a, uh, how would I say, um, like a, uh, from the maker community, just, just testing this for the first time? Or are you a more established, more mature company that actually has some services deployed? These will be things that eventually over time as you create your applications, you're going to have to consider. Um, there's, just, there's just no way around it. Where are you going to store your data? How are you going to do it? Public, private, you're going to have to make these decisions. Um, Peter, yes sir. I'm not sure I'm following where you're going. Could you maybe try to rephrase? What I'm saying is like there is, okay, so the Silicon Air, if, you have, if you're doing the platform, the platform is used like a embedded control engineer, try to do that, like a just a piece of the road. Okay, so, he, so maybe, maybe there's a little bit in terms of the, the verbiage. So from a platform perspective, I'm talking more of a cloud yeah. platform, but you may be talking about a more for terms of a, a hardware platform, is that? So, yeah, and I think where you're going with the question is, you know, moving forward, will others need to kind of follow, adopt? Is that what Not you're? Enough, no, but it's, it's going to be everybody is waiting for the platform to adopt. Like the OEM will be a bottleneck to the system to limiting, limiting yeah. like what you can provide. It, it certainly could be, but again, as as to developers here in the room today, you guys have been creating applications and stuff even without quote unquote the Synergy platform, right? For for those of you who are developers on the the traditional Renaissance. Um, proprietary cores, I mean, they're able to create solutions and applications independent of it. Now the notion of the Synergy platform is to kind of take a lot of that complexity underneath from the application to the hardware and really abstract a lot of that, make it, very, make it easier for developers to create applications on top of it. That's really the notion of why you'd have a platform underneath. Yes, sir. It might be a similar to how the Synergy Kitchen is being used. I mean, where you have like Apple and IBM and some of them, they develop devices, hardware, but they also have hardware devices. At the same time, they also can capture certain sort of standards and, and things that you and I have about that. You know, and this whole notion, and, and when we were on the panel, I think uh, some of the folks were asking about is there going to be de facto standards kind of moving forward? I think the question was, you know, is there one or two protocols that are going to, you know, prevail? And I think the only thing that I can see with that is the fact that there'll be more protocols that will actually be continuing to come out as as technology evolves. So one example you can think of Linux as a platform. I'm not plugging Linux. Just think of it. It runs on so many different hardware: Raspberry Pi, BW Black, RZA1, RZT. You don't have to wait. A lot of things, all the developer community is right now developing. Sorry. Oh. The developer community is developing on Linux. 
Now that's, everything is coming on Linux, so you can think of it that as a platform. So if you're waiting for two core processor, 10 core processor, the job is to make the platform, this is what Joe's talking about, you want to provide the software in such a way and abstract the APIs, they should not know the details of what's running underneath it. If you want to say, I want 10 cores, you should have enough horsepower to run 10 cores worth of compute versus thinking, oh, how should I program to run on this core or that core versus that core? That's the definition of a platform he's talking about. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else? Comments? So, I'll just kind of pop some of this stuff up here. I think we're on till is six. Six, got 10 minutes. We got a lot more stuff to cover. So, different things as you're going about this, right? Things to do, right? Putting too many features and functions. So, if you took, took Peter's um, comments to, to heart, start, eat, start simple and innovate. Don't try to boil the ocean all at once. Um, features with clear value proposition. Again, we see this a, a lot of times. Too many capabilities, too many functions, too many knobs causes confusion. People don't know what to do. We become uh, paralyzed by it. Under, underestimating security, privacy risk, right? I mean, consider the security at all levels. We talked about that all the way up in the stack. You need to have a strategy kind of moving forward. Security policies and requirements need to be understood and addressed. If you're designing products in certain industries, there's going to be regulatory compliance. And by regulatory compliance, I don't mean in terms of EMI, EMC, emissions, all that sort of stuff. I mean in terms of there may be certain things you have to adhere to. Understand those and make sure you address those. Failing to anticipate new competitive threats. We talked about this in the um, monetization class. The example I gave was, you know, in my dad's car, we had paper maps. You use, use those to find your way to where you're going. Tom, Tom, and Garmin kind of came out. We saw the battle of the two guys. I'm sure between each one, they're battling, what are they going to do? What are we going to do? Whatever else. And lo and behold, who comes flying by is the guy with the iPhone going 80 miles an hour. Competitive threat came out of nowhere. He's a phone guy. Why would a phone guy be doing anything with GPS? Same thing with digital camera. Another example there. So do not fail. Do not fail to anticipate where the new competitive threats come from. They're going to come from places that you don't think they're going to come from, from non-traditional ways. Your traditional competitors probably won't be your new competitors moving forward. Waiting too long to get started. Peter talked about the process paralysis and having to, 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 to um, negotiate all this. Put a toe in the water, try something, fail. I mean, at, at Arrow, in my role, Made a lot of different decisions. We went on a lot of different paths. Quite frankly, we blew up a number of times. Great, dust yourself up, pick yourself up, get dusted, and go try something different again. In this market, I mean, again, if you wait too long, opportunity will pass. And of course, finally, overestimating internal capabilities, right? This is really, really take a deep, hard look internal and say, what is it that we're really good at? What stuff do we need to outsource, buy, or get someplace else? We see a lot of companies, I can't tell you how many companies I work with when I ask them about you know, what's your backend solution, what's going to be, you know, how are you going to go ahead and you know, basically visualize all your data, They're like, well, we're going to build all this ourselves. And you look at them and they do a, a water monitor device sitting on a table, water purity. I'm looking at that and saying, how, does it, how do you become a network operations center expert when you make water purifiers? Really, really got to take a hard look at that. So, it's kind of really quick summarize. Some of the things, again, from, from an aero perspective, what we can kind of help you with, you know, Peter mentioned there's a lot of stuff up there that you have to kind of consider. Um, we can help you in terms of going through all those different uh, touch points, capabilities, functions, walk you through that one off at a time. Here's your trade offs, here's your capabilities, here's how you would do that. We can help you in terms of writing your marketing requirement specifications. You're getting into this for the first time, you're trying to sell some ideas internally to your organization, we can kind of help you with that. We've done system level architecture documents, kind of showing you how the pieces come together. We're very, very fond to work with you guys in terms of, hey, I just need help on the back end, I need help on the front end, I just need help with my certifications. Very, very a la carte. Financial assistance, um, this is something that's kind of interesting in that as we do work with customers and we do find very, very innovative products and services that are coming to the marketplace, we are very much open in terms of helping funding 
companies who are in startup mode who are emerging uh, technology providers. Again, we're a very, very conservative company. We're going to take a look at the upside. We're not interested in buying your company. It's just in terms of helping you bring your product to the marketplace. That could be everything in terms of you know, providing really, really long terms in terms of getting you the components to build, get you to sell, collect your money, and then we'll bill you later on it. A lot of different ways to work with us. System level schematic reviews for a lot of these complex systems. Life cycle analysis, you know, again, if you're a consumer, mar a consumer marketplace, you're, you're changing every six months, life cycle analysis on components may or may not be a big deal for you. But if you're gonna build something for 10 years, you're gonna definitely wanna come to us and say, okay, what is the likelihood? Am I choosing the right parts, the right devices? We talked about certification uh, consultation, right? With all the radios, all the technology that's on there, I now got a whole new class of intentional radiators. This is the first time I um, added an LTE type of a modem onto my device. Can you walk me through LTE, LTE certifications? Help me start at PTCRB, give me my forms filled out and get the process going. We also have an innovation boot camp with one of our um, uh, third party developers up in, um, up in Colorado. Five days, come on in, walk out proof of concept, business plan. And at the end of the day, right, our core technology, we have a best in breed catalog of technology and service providers. So a couple different things, you know, again, talk about the business problem. Well, this is, you know what, I actually, when I cut and pasted my stuff, this is from the previous, uh, previous deck. Complete the survey. Stop here and see if there's any questions. Yes, sir. When you're talking about anticipated competition from some unlikely location, some, some source. Well, and I, I think in, in a lot of ways, as so the question was, you know, as we're talking about, how do you actually look for unexpected competition, or how do you find it, or how do you seek it out? Example I would give you in, in some of this is, if, if I was, so I'm sitting up here as Aero Electronics, one thing I might look at is say, okay, what is my competition doing? The A's and the F's and all, everybody else, what is everybody else doing in this space? When really it could be, hmm, should I be looking at what the carriers are doing and how they're going to marketplace and how they're actually selling value-added gateways and services to my customers, my constituents. You know, so you, you really do have to be very, very versed in the market and looking, I mean, and saying, okay, well, who potentially could become? Um, and MVNO might be another example of that, where an MVNO really isn't a distributor, but if they want to integrate their SIM technology in cellular-enabled devices and sell them and offer them to their customers as a value add, that would be ways of looking at it. I mean, there's not a tried and true way, but you really do need to be cognizant and you know, eyes wide open. And I, I know I'm dancing the question, I'm not giving you, you, know, four, you know, a four step plan here. Yeah, because typically when we'll, you know, again, for, for many of us in here, when somebody says, well, what's the competition for this? We're gonna pick our traditional competitors and say, oh, this is really good at the end of the day. And I, I think the, the Tom Tom Garmin thing is a really good example. Because here's a fast evolving space that went from paper maps to these, these um, standalone devices to now everything on your phone. I mean, in a short, short period of time. Yep. Where your iPhone, where, where did that come from? Yeah. You know? Those darn guys at Apple, man, they're, they're ruining the, the light switches, the digital cameras, the maps, they're doing everything. <laughs> so anybody from Amazon here? Amazon? Amazon Web Services? Same thing. I mean, these guys really, really learn. Gotcha. These guys really, really learn in terms of technology. And, you know, again, I, I can easily see from, a, if I look at it from a pure distributor viewpoint, you know, Amazon certainly could do, I mean, supply chain logistics. Now, the difference between Amazon and Arrow is the fact that we actually know what's in the box, and we probably help advocate what's in, in the box itself, whereas they just ship empty boxes or boxes with stuff in it. Comments? Anybody else? Questions? There's a lot of stuff to consider in terms of what you're doing when, when you are doing this. And again, you know, the, the, the point today isn't more or less to kind of, you know, and as Peter kind of said, kind of scare you in it. These are things, these are realities of what you're doing. If you're going to go ahead and you're going to go do things in, um, 
in an oil and gas field, and you get a bunch of disparate IP sensors, you have to have a gateway technology, you have to have a means to connect them, you have to have somewhere to send the data. I'd love to say that you can just throw a Blackberry or not Blackberry, a Raspberry Pi or whatever else in it. The fact of the matter is very few people have any actually designed products with those widgets and devices. Anybody else? All right, I'll give you three minutes back. I think there's a survey. Um, I don't know if anybody's been doing this throughout the day, but there it is. Thank you, Atul, for getting up there, and thank you, Peter. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>